welcome tonight friends we are happy to have everyone joining us tonight thank you for being part of our study tonight as we look forward to an inspiring journey in the word of the Lord we are going to be praying at this time as we ask God's direction and God's grace upon what we will be considering let's pray together Lord we thank you you are indeed Lord creator the only potentate king of kings and the sovereign of the universe we commit our ways to you tonight as we will be looking in your words let your divine light shine upon our dark understanding and cause dear Lord our minds to be illuminated with your truth bless those who will join in our study tonight and I pray dear word, Lord your words will cause faith to arise transformation to occur and miracles to happen I put my mind in your hands that you will channel it according to your purpose in Jesus name Amen so the Lord bless you brothers and sisters as we will be continuing our study tonight on the book of Genesis this is the third in our Genesis series and uh, last week we dealt with the first five days of creation we did indicate that on day one according to Genesis 1 verse 1 in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth we did indicate that the beginning refers to the beginning of time the heavens refers to space and the earth refers to matter mass and so in the beginning God initiated time created space and put within space mass verse 2 describe the state that that mass was in when it was first created it says the earth was without form and void it was shapeless and empty and waste and uh, it was covered by water and darkness covered the deep and this was the state of the original primordial elements when God created time space and matter all the elements of the periodic table there was they were in a state of not uniformity but chaos but then the spirit of the Lord began to brood over the face of the water and God interject energy into the creative space and uh, when that energy was introduced into the creative space he called for it light so we see the three elements of Einstein theory of general relativity at play with E equal MC square energy equal mass times the speed of light squared God was putting together the laws of physics and chemistry in out of the chaos that he created in verse 1 and then having seen what he did on day 1 he went on on day 2 to create an atmosphere 
separating the waters and creating an atmospheric level layer above the earth and on the third day he went on to cause more order and division when he separated and gathered the water that covered the earth he gathered them in one place and he called the water sea and the dry land appear earth now had a form and a shape and the next thing he went on to do on the third day was to call forth the flora the vegetation the grass and the herbs and the trees and we see now no longer was the earth empty no longer was it formless without form no longer was it void it now was occupied by natural vegetation on day four god began to furnish the heavens with stars and in verse 4 the Bible says he created the stars and he created a sun bearer a light bearer rather a body that would control the lights of the earth and he created the sun and the stars and with that the planetary uh, creation the gravitational forces of the planets came into play and we had the rotation of the earth and we begin to have days and seasons as we know it today and so on the fourth day the heavens were furnished on the fifth day he furnished the, the sea with sea creatures he furnished the sea with all the sea creatures which were to breed abundantly and he also furnished the atmosphere with creatures that would fly the sky creatures and he now came to the sixth day and uh, on the sixth day he created the land animals the beast that would inhabit the forest and the jungles he created the cattle that would commingle with what was to come and he created the creeping reptiles and insects and after he was true he paused and he came to the climax of his creative work. He was about now to perform his most glorious act of creation. This was the moment. This was to be the hour. All that had taken place before in the past five days was in preparation for what was about to happen and then God spake hallelujah see before the, the word of God is powerful he the, the power that God works with is creative power and the creative power is the power of his word when he speak what he speaks happen that's why it's possible for God to lie for when God speak, his word is creative. So God now paused and he said, let us make man in our own image. Let me speak a little to the let us. Because the Jews understand and interpret this declaration as a figure of speech called the majestic plural in our english language we would know it as no schism where a person would address themselves in the plural let us yes it is a form of speech 
the Jews would understand it to express the majesty and grandeur of the speaker and calls attention to the import of the action to be executed. There are four such verses in the Bible which this figure of speech, the majestic plural, is used. It is used in Genesis 1 verse 26. Also in Genesis 3 22 when God says the man is become like one of us. It also uses Genesis 11 verse 6 when God said, let us go down and see what is happening at Babel. And in Isaiah 6, 8, when it was declared from heaven, who will go for us? Now, these passages were not intended to convey a notion of a plurality of the Godhead. It is simple, a linguistic tool that God employs to accentuate his greatness. Yes, brothers and sisters, when it came to man, God paused. He self-reflected. He internalized. He counseled with himself. And he called on all his divine attributes and brought to bear the fullness of his Godhead on the species that he was about to create because this was now to be the crowning moment and the crowning glory of creation so we see god says let us make man in our own image but it went on to say that god created man in his own image signifying that there was no plurality of God, but he was using the figure of majestic plural to draw attention to the magnitude and grandeur of the actions he was about to execute. And so we see in Genesis verse 1, 26, the first mention of the word man. This is the first place where the word man appear. The word man in the Hebrew is actually Adam. That's uh, the Hebrew word for man, Adam. So that's where Adam got his name in chapter 2 verse 19 where the word Adam first appear in the King James Version. But as I said, the Hebrew word for man is Adam. And it is related to the Hebrew word for ground um, used in chapter 2 verse 7 where it says God formed man from the dust of the ground. The Hebrew word for ground is Adama. Adama. So these words are connected and so the word Adam actually carries the notion of being from the ground. It also means red and it is an indication of Adam's material composition. So we see where the Bible says in Genesis 2 verse 7 that God now created man from the dust of the ground. Amen. Verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life and man became a living soul. So here we see brothers and sisters, man being formed from the dust. Ecclesiastes 12.7 tells us that the dust man shall return to the earth 
as it was from whence he came. In Ecclesiastes 3.19 it tells us that all will return to the dust again. In Psalms 104 verse 29, Psalmist says, Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breaths, they die and return to their dust. So the, 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 the scripture says, God formed man from the dust of the ground. And it was referring to the physical composition of man. You see, God spoke the animals into being. But for man, it was to be an intimate journey. Man was not just spoken into being. Yes, he was to be an intimate, special edition, handcrafted product of God. So God got down to work and he sculptured the body of man from the dust of the earth. This was to be his personal artistic masterpiece. The body of man shaped and fashioned and handcrafted by God himself. And so God created man from the dust of the earth. And the body structure that God made from the earth, when it was true, it looked like a corpse in a casket. It lay there lifeless, motionless, inanimate. And it was just the corpse, the body. Just as our car has a body frame, but it needs power, it needs someone to power it up so it can move and do marvelous things and go boom, boom. That car needs to be powered up. Just as our computer, when it is assembled, is useless. It is just a configuration of physical parts of hardware. But someone has to program it with a software, an operating system, and then boot it up. And then it can do incredible things. Just as our light bulb is just a configuration of material things but it is lifeless and lightless but when someone introduces electricity to that bulb it lights up and begin to glow and so the man was there lifeless like uh, the body of a car like the hardware of a computer like a bulb disconnected but then the Bible says God breathed the wind of God, the life force of God, breathed into the nostril of man. Yes, I call this the kiss of life. When God breathed into the nostril of man, then man became a living soul. Yes, brothers and sisters, when the life force of God entered the body, man became a living soul. The man got a persona, he became animate, and he came forth a unique individual with personality, spirituality, self-consciousness, world consciousness, and God consciousness. He had self-determination and the intelligence. This was made possible by the breath of God. So in this verse, brothers and sisters, we see the tripartite nature of man. Man made up of body, the physical material from the earth, the organic material of the earth. But then that body without the spirit from God is dead. But when the spirit of God blew life, 
the life force into the body, the body became a person. It took on a persona. Man became a living soul. So we see the three components of man, body, soul, and spirit. The spirit is the life force. That is what animates the body. And everybody have it, the good have it, the wicked have it, the poor have it, the, 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 the rich have it. That's what give life to the body. But then the soul is the individual, the consciousness and the individuality within that body is the product of the life force uniting with the body. So brothers and sisters, understand this. The, the body belongs to the earth. That's where it came from. The spirit of life, the life force belongs to God. That's where it come from. And the only thing we have is our soul. So when it comes to the end, Ecclesiastic 12, 7 tells us, Then shall the dust return to the earth, because our body belongs to the earth. But then the spirit shall return to God that gave it. But our personality, our choices, our life, decisions, the life that we have made for ourselves here on earth, that's all we will have at the end of the day. Yes, brothers and sisters, we are not just physical being. We are spiritual being. And we are soulical individuals. So Jesus told us to fear not him who can destroy the body but him who can destroy both body and soul and cast it into hell. And what happened is at death, the spirit leaves the body. And when the life force leaves the body, the body is disconnected and is of no more use. And it begins to decompose and return to the earth. Yes, brothers and sisters, so we see the creation of man. God created man in his own image. Yes, man is the only creature that truly reflects and resembles God. The image of God. The man mirrors God. An image is a representation of an object or a person. An expression. A representation. And man is an expression of God. As I said, the only creature in the universe who can truly reflect what God look like. So God told Israel not to build any image of himself. Said you shall make no image of God because God already has made an image of himself which was mankind. Yes, brothers and sisters, when the animals see us, they see God in us. That's why every animal is afraid of man. Because when they see us, they see God in us. Yes, man is the image of God. The Bible tells us in Colossians 1.15 of Jesus Christ that he is the express image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Yes, brothers and sisters, God has... God touches, but he has no hands. He walks, but he has no feet. 
He thinks, but he has no brain. He hears, but he has no lobes. Yes, he has no physical form because he's a spirit. But all these attributes, he gave a physical representation when he made man. All these attributes of God, he, he personified in the creature called man. Yes, brothers and sisters, when you want to know what God looked like, man in his original state was a representation of God's glory. But the image of God was not only confined to the physical appearance of man. It also speaks to man's ability to decide. Man's ability to reason, make choices. Man's ability to worship, which connects him with God and put him on a spiritual plane. Man's ability to rule and dominate as he was now going to be the ruler of the domain of earth. And so in this regard, man was expressing, representing and showing forth the glory of God and the attributes of God would now be displayed by man in his government of earth in his whole his whole stewardship of earth how he was going to be now operating was be would be the physical representation of how god manages the universe yes brothers and sisters that was man in his original estate glorious one that the psalmist says in psalms 139 verse 14 i will praise thee for i am fearfully and wonderfully made marvelous are thy works and that my soul know it well he says in the hundred psalms we are his people and the sheep of his pastures it is he that have made us and not we ourselves yes brothers and sisters on the sixth day god brought his creative act to a glorious climax to a majestic crescendo when he breathed into the corpse made from the earth yes and produce a masterpiece man is god's masterpiece fearfully and wonderfully made there is no creature like man in the whole universe unique yeah i can imagine when god was constructing and the body of man he knelt down to craft this creature he might have says you know i gave the elephant a long nose but this creature i don't want him pushing his nose in other people's business so i'm going to give him a cute little nose I can imagine he, when he, he came down, he says, you know, I give the, the, the giraffe a long neck, but I don't want this creature putting his neck over people's fence. So he just took a, a neat little neck on that creature. He, he, he said that the donkey has a long face, but this creature, I'm going to give him the facial muscular ability to smile and to laugh and to express joy and so he made man with the capacity to express joy through laughter and smiling and of all the other creatures he put them on fours to walk but he says this is my masterpiece 
I'm going to set him uprightly to walk with his head high and his shoulders broad. He's supposed to depict of dignity and majesty. He's going to walk and every other creature that sees him is going to awe and wonder because they are going to see a reflection of my power in him. This is the masterpiece that God created at creation, flawless and in harmony, in unity and unity. Man was majestic in all his ways and his faculty, the masterpiece of creation designed to rule earth designed to dominate earth and designed to be an expression a representation an image of god so when the angels want to see what god looks like they would look at man because the bible says that he dwells in light that no man can approach the Bible tells us in Timothy that in Jesus Christ, amen, God was manifested in the flesh, justified of the spirit and seen of angels. Angels were getting the first comprehensive and total look at, at God when Jesus walked because man in his original state he lost that glory because of disobedience. And we will deal with that next week. But brothers and sisters, I am happy that there was a restoration of man's glory through the baptism of the Holy Spirit made possible by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Man fell from that glorious heights. Man has not evolved. As the scientists said. But man has devolved. Man has diminished. Yes. Man did not evolve from being cavemen. Man devolved from being the image of God. And became cavemen. The sin that caused men. To begin to behave. On godlike or ungodly amen we lost our god kind our, we became mankind after our own stiff naked ways and choices but through jesus christ the glory of god has been restored there is now the light we are now the light bearers a royal priesthood a holy nation a peculiar people so i want to encourage us tonight brothers and sisters those of us that have experienced the second act of creation and we'll go on to that at some point but after six days God finished his work of creation. There was nothing more to do. And so he rested on the seventh day. He looked at what he did. And he says it was very good. Yes, brothers and sisters. I'll just say one thing about the seventh day. As next week we will be dealing up with the subject in the garden with God. I'm going to speak to the creation of the woman and the whole matter of the garden of Eden. But brothers and sisters, after he had finished his work on the sixth day, the Bible says, and God rested on the seventh day and on the seventh day god ended his works which he made and he rested on the seventh day from all his works which he had made and god blessed the seventh day 
and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. I will not be dealing tonight extensively with the seventh day rest because I will be doing a series on the Sabbath. But suffice to say that in these two verses, verse 2 and 3 of Genesis 2, 3, no mention is made here of a Sabbath. The word Sabbath is not even used. No commandment is given to man to observe a Sabbath. God alone worked and God alone rested. Why did he rest? He rested not because he was weary. Because the creative works of God was not physical. He did not expend physical energy. He expended creative energy, which was the energy of his creative work. So God rested because his works were finished. This work, this rest is totally confined to God. Now, after God rested the seventh day, what did he do on the eighth day? There was nothing more to do, so he rested on the eighth day. And after he rested on the eighth day, what did he do on the ninth day? There was nothing more to do. He continued resting on the ninth day. And after he was finished on the tenth day, what was there more to do? Nothing more to do. He rested because this rest of God was intended to be an eternal rest where he ceased from the work of creation and begin to enjoy his relationship with man and the new world that he had created. But the rest of God was disturbed by sin. That's why Paul in Hebrews 4, he tells us that we must labor to enter into his rest. That's why when Jesus came, he said to the Pharisees who contested his workings of miracle on the Sabbath, he said, the Father worketh and I worketh hither. And if the Father is working on the Sabbath, how will work hither? Because there needed to be a new creation. Sin provided a need for a new creation. And God had to disturb his rest to work on the plan of salvation. But there remained therefore a rest for the people of God. And the Bible said we must labor lest the promise be left us of entering into that rest. That rest is the eternal rest. When our redemption will be completed, when our body of sin will be transformed into the likeness of his glorious body, and we will again take on the full image and representation of God. For the Bible said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There is a rest promised for the people of God, and that rest will occur when Jesus return to make a new heaven and a new earth to remove sin and curse from the world and then the Bible says there will be no sun or moon so there will be no need to keep Sabbath because eternity will be one long eternal Sabbath that will never be broken so until then the call of Jesus Christ is 
Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And to you who are troubled, come rest with us. For with stammering lips and another tongue, he said he would speak to this people. And this is the rest wherein he will cause the weary to rest. So, in closing, the seventh day, brothers and sisters, Adam was never given a commandment. The only possible way for Adam to have sinned was to have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the only command he was given in the beginning. If he was given a command to keep the Sabbath, there would have been the possibility of him breaking the Sabbath. And causing sin by breaking the Sabbath. But the only restriction and the only way that death would have visited upon Adam, God said, was if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because there was no other commandment given to Adam. How could have Adam be told not to commit adultery? When Adam did not even know what adultery means. He was oblivious to sin and evil. Did not even know what it means to lie. He didn't know how to lie. Didn't know how to steal. And he couldn't steal because everything was his. And so there was no commandment. The Ten Commandment was not given to Adam. He did not even know about sin. All the commandment he was given was don't eat of the fruit. So with the seventh day, God brought his creative work to closure. And he began what was to be his eternal rest next week brothers and sisters we will talk about creation of the woman and life on earth before sin entered god bless you i'm happy that you were able to join me for this study tonight we are gonna pray amen solomon says remember now thy creator as he tells of his life's experience in the book of Ecclesiastes. And as he tried to figure his way back to God after failing God. He summed up the experiments that he was doing. The life experiments that he undertook. He summed up the conclusion. He said here the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandment. This is the old duty of man. He says, remember your creator. When you are young and strong, fear him and give him the best of your life. So I trust tonight for those of you who are not honoring God. You are not pleasing God. This is a day of grace. Where God can put his creative hands upon you. Put the pieces back together again. And make you into a new creation. For if any man be in Christ. He is a new creation. All things are passed away. Yes brothers and sisters. If you are in sin. You can have a new beginning. Through the second Adam. Jesus Christ, our Lord, will you serve him? Yes, brothers and sisters, wherever you are listening, if you are not saved, you can find an apostolic church close to you. Amen. And seek instruction and get baptized in the name of Jesus. You can find one of our United Pentecostal Church near you. If there's none, or if there's an apostolic church, find a pastor and... Get yourself prepared for a new life.
remember your creator let's pray lord jesus i give you praise and honor we are your people the sheep of your pasture i worship you lord i give you glory you are the only potentate king of kings and lord of lords i pray that the consciousness of your grandeur and power may become real to your children lord may we not dishonor you by murmuring about the issues of life and complaining about the trivial things of life but may we trust you may we lord god oh god i like your power by praising you even in the midst of difficulty touch those who are not saved right now lord and let your spirit lead them into your presence i give you thanks in jesus name amen yes brothers and sisters join us on sunday for a great time of worship if you're in the maypen environs amen you can call 310-4630 we'll arrange to get you to church amen uh, pentecostal cathedral in the canaanites area we have a lovely church there with some lovely people come and experience the presence of god there and if you are in the Kingston area, I invite you to worship with us, Pentecostal Sanctuary, Upper Waterloo Road and the Grand Spen Road. And you can call 924-2730 for further directions. God bless you. And let me leave you with one of these, amen, lovely songs we used to sing in our amen sunday school years ago oh we want back those sunday school songs amen being songs all things bright and beautiful amen all right we're not getting it up so the Lord bless you. You can send your questions in the comment area. If we can, we will certainly try and answer them and join me next week.
the tall trees in the green wood the meadows where we play the rushes by the water to get